Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, because we all love game nights with our family and friends. But when you play solo games, then every night can be a game night. Check us out, along with other great podcasts, at Dicetowernetwork.com. Every Night is Game Night, episode 147, Heroes of Arion, and the Psychology of Cheating in Content Creation. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to the Every Night is Game Night podcast. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Uh, This is a mostly solo endeavor this week. Uh, I have a couple of reviews for you, one of which I did with Anthony. I pre-recorded a long time ago. Uh, I've been looking for an opportunity to play this review for Arion. Arion is a game that I know our audience has been uh, mostly playing and enjoying, uh, posting about it on solo board gamers. Maybe we've moved on a little bit, waited a little too long for this one. (laughs) Sorry about that. Uh, but we have that review for you, uh, just in case you are curious about the Oniverse and uh, our thoughts about it. Also, I have another review for you, Heroes of Tenefear, which is a deck builder. I know people get excited about their deck builders, so uh, happy to chat about that one as well. And then I have a little bit of a follow-up uh, on the last week's episode, which I personally enjoyed, The Psychology of Cheating at Board Games with Dr. Corey Butler. Um, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Uh, you know, I, I love the psychological stuff. <laughs> um, this week, though, uh, 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 something has happened in the board gaming sphere, the board gaming verse, uh, that kind of caught fire on Twitter, and it's caused a lot of discussion. And I may be a little bit late to the party on this one, but there's a certain angle on it that I really, really wanted to kind of talk about uh, for the discussion topic today. Uh, so I called it the psychology of cheating in content creation. Last week was about gaming. This week is about content creation. What do I mean? Uh, a personality in the board gaming universe uh, was recently outed, uh, so to speak, for plagiarism. And people are wondering, what's that all about? That seems a little bit weird. Why Why bother plagiarizing? Isn't, don't people know that's wrong? All these questions are happening and a lot of discussion is happening. So I do have a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, I will definitely drill down, you know, kind of. Uh, try to cover the topic from all angles and invite discussion, you know, as always. Uh, that's what ENG is all about, or at least, you know, I'm really trying to push in that direction of discussions and interesting things to talk about and kind of leaving the door open for you guys to engage as much as possible. So that's what the episode's going to be about, uh, but you know how we roll here on Every Night is Game Night. Before we get back to that clip of me and Anthony reviewing Arion, uh, we are going to get to Liz in the Liz We Trust segment. I happen to know what this Kickstarter is. I'm a backer of this particular project myself, so I'm looking forward to it. Liz, tell us all about Role Player. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to encourage your Every Night is Game Night acquisition disorder. Today I want to talk about Roleplayer, Fiends and Familiars, designed by Keith Mateka and published by Thunderworks Games. If you haven't played Roleplayer yet, you're missing out on a real solo treat. Roleplayer is a dice rolling game about creating the best possible fantasy character. In Fiends and Familiars, you not only get to work on new types of characters, but you can do it with the help of a loyal pet. Of course, that also means you'll have to deal with fiends who are there to make your life a little more difficult. I am personally a huge role player fan, and Fiends and Familiars was an insta bag for me. If you want to go down the rabbit hole with me, definitely check it out. Happy gaming! Uh, okay, so let us get into the Oniverse, uh, and we'll just go right, go right for the newest one. Uh, Anthony and I have gotten a chance to get Arion to the table. Let's talk about it. Yeah, Arion is the newest, and based on the name, obviously it has to do with flying and ships. Uh, and like anything in the Oniverse, the theme is convoluted. It's like this weird dream world, so... Things are happening, but it doesn't always look like what it says is happening. <laughs> but the idea is a theme. The theme is there. You're air, you're like an airline mechanic, and you're putting together you're putting together ships from ship parts. I think that think that sounds like a theme to me. Yeah, the theme is there, but like I feel like some of his games, the artwork, you can tell what it is. This one more than others, it was decently difficult sometimes. I'm like, what is this? What is this a picture of? I don't really know. Uh, I still like it. It's really great, and I just like going through it. It's very kind of whimsical, dreamish, but I wasn't really sure what I was looking at half the time. Um, 
But that's not what I'm reviewing because I don't really generally care about those things. Uh, <laughs> the, the idea of the game is that you are trying to build these six ships. And they all start out face down. There's little cardboard tokens. You have six decks of cards. And to build the ships, you need three different pieces. You need a blueprint, a materials, and a crew. You have to get the blueprints, the material first before you can put the crew out. And you do that by drawing them from these different display cards that are in front of each of the decks. And you just got to do that before you run out of cards, basically. So on your turn, you're going to roll dice. And based on the patterns of the dice, you can take from different decks. So each of these decks has a different pattern on it. So like one might be two pairs, one might be four of a kind, one might be a full house. And sometimes you might have multiple options based on the dice in front of you. Sometimes you might have no options. There are some cards you, you can get that like give you some flexibility. Like there's a library card. You can have one of those in front of you um, that allows you to do different things. If you can't actually play you know, the book, I guess it goes, what's it called? Your pulpit or something. Um, there's also pixies that you start the game with. There, I think you have three or four of them. And you can change. You play with the pixies. Come on now. <laughs> I'm just saying they're in the box. And <laughs> <laughs> if you play the base game, you better not be playing with those pixies. No, because the base game is so easy. Uh, but oh, you, yeah. if you do play with them, if you're learning the game, whatever, you can use those to change dice. And the game is pretty quick, like any Oniverse game. You roll the six dice. You look at the combination. You take a card. You may re-roll depending on if you need to, uh, whether you have the option to do so. And then you will acquire the card and place it somewhere in front of you. So you have two workshops. You can place, basically, you can start two different ships at a time. If those two workshops are occupied, you will either need to spend your book card to place the card over on the reserve or just discard it. So don't get yourself in a position where you can't actually do anything. But at the same time, there is some flexibility there. And then you refresh the, the decks. So... You just kind of go through that and do that until you build your six ships or you run out of cards. Base game, super easy. I I won the first time through, was thoroughly bored. Uh, played it a couple more times, was thoroughly bored. I think like any Oniverse game, you have to put the expansions in. The question just becomes which ones are good. So right. I have not played with all of them. I haven't really gotten through all of them. Um, there are, of course, a few, like there usually are. This one, I don't know. Like, even with the expansion stuff, I just... It's just not exciting. I don't know. I just didn't feel drawn into it. Maybe I just haven't played the right expansions yet. But uh, it's not my favorite of the Oniverse games at this point. So, I liked it. Uh, part of why I liked it, I actually gave it... Um, with the, it has to be with expansions, first of all. And I think the first two expansions, which is a flagship... And the hourglasses. Um, putting those in there will give you a decent challenge and give you kind of the feel of the game. So I'm a little bit insane. I love playing my Oniverse games with all the expansions shuffled in. I play. <laughs> I love playing. I love playing Onirim with all seven expansions. It's nuts. It's insane. I I don't know if they're gonna put all seven into the app, which they should. Which I thought they were going to, and I haven't. We haven't gotten a new expansion in like a year, so I'm afraid <laughs> we may never see it. Uh, but I, I I do play the Arion with all the expanded Hammerbirds and the, and the Hellkite and all that stuff. I really love the decision space that it opens up because you can choose. You know, do I go for a worker this turn? Do I go for a peer? Do I go for? Uh, do I need to clear off these the egg things or like I, you get you get a lot of decisions. A lot of the re, the decisions that make this game really good, which is. How do I use, do I kind of like go with what I have, usually going to roll two pair, uh, which is fine, or do I do the Yahtzee thing, like, you know, go for more? And they take that core Yahtzee experience of like, okay, do I just take what I have or do I go for more and make a, what I thought was a real game out of it. So I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoy the shuffle together game. It's too long. It's 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 over an hour, which you don't. <laughs> most people not. Whoa! Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think I may have gotten down to under an hour, but like, that's after multiple plays and getting used to the, the whole thing. Uh, but I just love the decision space of it. I really was charmed by it. I get where you're coming from because the lesser game is there's just not a lot of there there, especially that like the base game. The base game is I can't believe that they made it to press that easy. You just you need that extra level of stuff to do in order to really add the challenge. 
But I mean, just the like the Yahtzee of it. I I, I happen to have a, like a real appreciation of Yahtzee because I can play it in all sorts of circumstances. I play it with families. I play it in therapy. I've played it with like a person who has kind of mid level Alzheimer's. They can still play Yahtzee. So I've played a lot of it, and maybe I I it appeals to me more because of that. And I, I guess you're just you're not just you're just not a Yahtzee guy. So if you're not a Yahtzee guy, if you have no fun in that space probably not going to have fun in the system that's the thing though is i, I like yahtzee I, I like that mechanic i don't know what it is about this game it just doesn't capture me yet i don't i think what it is is that it might be best with a bunch of stuff thrown in but it's not the kind of game i want to play for 45 minutes to an hour really none of the universe right. games are they're, they're when i pull one of these games out it's because i want to play something that's going to take 20 or 30 minutes and give me a decent challenge, and if I want to reset and play it again, it's easy to do that. This game, similar to Natillion, gets me in the space of, like, well, I can't really do that. It's a pain in the butt to set. I don't know. I don't want to do all this and mix all this stuff in. Um, I generally don't play any of these games with, that, with more than, like, one or two expansions in them because it just adds right. too much. And too long. Too long. I don't like the fact that this game is not very good unless you do that. So I, it just hasn't really captured me. I mean, one of these times... I will do it just because I, you know, the way you describe it, I'm like, sounds like I should like that. I just, I don't know if I have the energy to like try to keep the rules for all five, six expansions in my head at once. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, it's so weird. It's backwards. It's like me saying, oh, the game's too long. And you're like, no, more game. Make it longer. <laughs> I, I really dislike the fact that it's so long with all the stuff shuffled in. I dislike the fact that my optimal experience with this game is having all of that decision stuff there for me. And in order to get that, I have to make the game longer. I don't like that. Like, you know, and I'm sad about that. However, it's it's so much fun to be in those round by round decision spaces of, okay, should I go for this? Should I go for this? I was going for this, but I ended up getting this. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going for, you know, the, you know, the four of a kind, which is kind of a hard thing to get. It's six dice. So it's not that, that hard. Uh, but then I, I rolled five of a kind and, you know, I really need that four of a kind card. But then I can turn over this pier, which is five of a kind, which is really, really much harder. And uh, <laughs> decisions. <laughs> you only get those decisions with a bunch of stuff shuffled in. And like I said, it's going to be too long for most most players. I'm a little bit insane when it comes to this stuff. Uh, you know, so I enjoy certain parts of it. I, I can understand, though, if, if you're a player who just wants it more kind of concentrated. It, concentrate is not what this game does. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's just what I go for in an universe game. Um, but I don't know. I'll give it a shot. I, I I like the complex challenge of trying to figure out a puzzle like that. It's just maybe it's just my headspace of like this is not what these are for. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely more positive on it than Anthony is, and that's kind of where we'll leave that one. Hey everybody, I am back. It is just me now. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, hearing from Anthony again. I know that he doesn't pop on the pod too often these days. Uh, it's a very busy summer, very busy year for him, actually. Uh, like I always say, you can go ahead and check out his regular weekly show, Board Gamers Anonymous. That's about all, <laughs> about as much time as he has. Uh, he devotes to that show, which is perfectly fine. Uh, that is his baby. He was, he's been on there for about five, six years now. And this one, uh, this show is about three years old. So, um, yeah, that was great hearing from Anthony. Uh, that was actually a clip from a larger episode. Uh, that episode didn't quite come together as much as I wanted to. I'm going to revisit that concept. Uh, the original concept for that episode uh, at a later date. For now, I hope you enjoyed the review of Arion. So the next game that I'm going to talk about is called Heroes of Tenefear. Heroes of Tenefear was designed by Pepchin Van Loon, published by Broken Mill, a small publisher from the Netherlands. And if you know anything about this show, you know that we love covering uh, the smaller publishers, smaller games. I want stuff out of left field, so keep it coming, guys. <laughs> And this one is a little bit different. Uh, I know it's a deck builder. And when you say the word deck builder or when a reviewer says the word deck builder, you kind of get about 50% of the game just right there. Uh, once you've played one deck builder, you've kind of played a lot of them. You know, you are started with your hand of crappy cards. You draw five of them. You scan the market. Uh, you buy what you want. Put it in your discard pile. Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. You know, ever since Dominion came out in 2008. Uh, you know, some deck builders kind of wrinkle up that formula. A lot of them just kind of give you the same thing with a little bit of a change. 
The big thing about that style of deck builder is that the biggest decisions come during the buy phase. So you buy your cards and you're comboing whatever goes into the discard pile is what you have. And then you shuffle it and you don't have a lot of control over what comes out. And at that play phase, when you're playing your cards, you're saying, okay, I'm looking at it. Uh, Dominion actually does it a little bit better because it has that separate buy phase and you have to kind of like, okay, I have multiple cards and what do I go to play? What can I afford? Blah, blah, blah. Especially since the Star Realm slash Ascension kind of innovation of just play all your cards, which is a simple thing. Uh, but it kind of has the drawback of, well, there's no real strategy there. It's like, okay, what, what did I get? Boom. <laughs> the strategy was in the buy phase, you know, and you're just kind of executing, you know, kind of pressing play on the strategy uh, in that kind of deck builder. So that's kind of where we're at in terms of the evolution of a lot of popular deck builders. So this game, Heroes of Tenefear, is it stood out to me because it's so different. It's a deck builder, but the core experience of it and the headspace of it is just so different that I got really excited playing it. So mind you, I didn't get excited about the theme. I mean, the theme is generic fantasy. Uh, you are a hero and you're trying to fight your way through a dungeon and the deeper you dungeon you go, the more stuff you get. <laughs> that one has kind of been done over and over again. However, deck builders have the advantage of representing that growth of a hero uh, from little weenie, little uh, uh, guy that can barely do anything or gal uh, that can barely do anything to a you know really buffed up hero that can basically conquer the world. So in Heroes, you're representing your character with a really terrible deck. I mean, it has like six one combat cards, and combat is kind of the only main currency of the game. Uh, so six one combat card, six zero combat card, which is terrible. Uh, and like a unique card, one unique card that kind of differentiates the classes. So like you Bard and Cleric and all that kind of thing. So, okay, I mean, not, we're not that different there. And then the market... Uh, you know, we're starting to get a little bit different there. Uh, the mark is actually a dungeon. So it has double-sided cards depicting a monster on one side and loot on the other. And each of the different levels is a different pile of cards. You have level one, level two, level three, level four, and these are each a pile. And as you go to the game, you're going to be basically attacking a pile. That's a round. Uh, you, you know, you attack all the monsters in a pile and whatever comes out, comes out, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it could be goblins, it could be kobolds, it could be whatever. It depends on how that level one pile has been shoveled before the game. So I just finished saying that the market phase, the buy phase is where the decision space is in a lot of deck builders. This is not where the decision space is here in Heroes. Uh, you decide to you want to go defeat a pile. If you're a weenie, you have to um, hit one of the level one piles. It makes sense to kind of hit level two, level three, level four. You don't really know what is in of those piles. So you're just kind of like going in blind, like an adventure and figuring it out. And then when you defeat cards, you flip them over to their item side and that's what you get in your hand. So since you don't know what is there, you not really don't you don't really know what's going in your hand. Uh, and also there's like this, because you're, it's a cooperative game, you're doing this in a turn order. Uh, you might not be the one that delivers the killing blow and to get that particular item into your deck. Uh, <laughs> so if you can't do enough damage in your turn, you have to kind of punt it to the next player. And if the next player does finishes it off and does the damage, then they get the card. It's like, oh man, I could have used that. There's a couple of ways in which the players can trade cards. That's mostly from rewards of actually finishing the dungeon. There's these modular rewards that you can get. Uh, but for the most part, you get what you get. Okay, so here's a decision space. So I apologize, I'm burying the lead a little bit in terms of the main pitch of the game. Uh, I wanted to set that context of what deck builders usually are and how this one is different. It's kind of how I wanted to approach it. So this one is different because it is a push your luck centric uh, approach to deck building. So in this game, when you draw your cards on a particular turn, you only draw three, and that is what you have to use. If you don't like what you draw, either you draw a bunch of zeros, or you, you know, you're really hoping to defeat a monster, you don't get enough combat value, whatever that it, it is that uh, leads you to not be happy with your hand. You can actually discard and draw again. Or if you have kind of half of what you need, you know, you draw two zeros and a one, which is kind of below average of what you can get, but you don't, you know, you're starting to get a little bit low on the draw. And it's like, uh, so I really want to kind of press my luck here and uh, draw again. 
because there are a couple of considerations, right? One, your deck is kind of like your life points. Uh, you do not reshuffle. Uh, if you reach the end of your deck, then that's it. You are the, the round is over, and you and if you haven't defeated a dungeon by yet, uh, you're done. <laughs> Or uh, if you go through and you have kind of a weak hand, then you decide to pass it over to your partner. Your partner says, oh, my hand is kind of terrible too. And you don't defeat the monster, then you're just defeated. And that really is terrible. Like, I mean, if you get slowed down in the progress, there's not a lot of rounds to do what you got to do. Maybe like 10 rounds in the base game. Like you have 10 rounds to kind of become a buff uh, enough character in order to be able to handle that final boss because it's the final boss round. Uh, if you get delayed in that, if you don't clear a bunch of those dungeon piles out and acquire those cards into your hand and make them improved, and then you're just going to lose. So you really have to, you, have, you can't just like be safe and say, okay, I I don't have a lot of cards. If I don't know what I'm going to draw, I'm just going to kind of turtle up. Nope, you got <laughs> you to be really bold in order to be able to get the cards that you need, which may not end up working out for you because of the nature of the push your luck and because of the nature of the cards that you might draw, the nature of the next monster you might say that okay uh we have to clear this pile out this one one monster let's just go for it and that just happens to be a monster with a power that negates what your draw does well you know it, uh, the monster will say uh you get negatives for all the zeros that you have in your discard pile and he's like oh my god i have all my zeros in my discard pile <laughs> oops <laughs> So, I mean, I'm going on and on, but that's my favorite part of the game is how different uh, it feels from the normal run of the mill, uh, make all your decisions during the buy phase uh, deck builder. Uh, this one, you know, you draw your three cards and you're wondering, oh, what's going on here? And as you move on, you'll get different cards. You'll have more draw. The cards will combo together in certain ways. Or if you're facing, if you're facing certain monsters, the cards will get better. So you're going to wrinkle up. Uh, gameplay a little bit as you move on and there'll be a lot to do like maybe you'll be draw you know four or five six seven cards uh, as you progress through the game uh, so that was good <laughs> and, and you know I really really enjoyed that part so there's a couple of things that I found a little bit difficult uh, the first one is I definitely felt like if you did get off to that good start if you you know the your weenie deck and your um, first dungeon kind of align where you can get through that first dungeon and just you know clear it out it doesn't happen all the time but you know often enough especially uh i've played a lot of this game solo uh you know a couple of my solo games just kind of like happen this way where clear out the dead clear out the first dungeon get all those items and you're kind of ahead of the curve and the more you defeat dungeons the more uh the less the challenge of defeating dungeon comes into play so like you know i got my two dungeons worth of cards in my deck and I would just kind of go through. And then the other thing that's a difficulty in this game, and this might be a little bit more of a deal breaker uh, for certain uh, gamers, especially lovers of deck builders, is that maybe they went a little bit too far in terms of taking this strategy out of the market phase. I really did feel like uh, not only was there not a lot of agency within the market phase, like if you defeat a card, then it just goes in your deck. But I found the powers of the cards themselves, I guess by necessity because of the design, uh, they it didn't matter, really. Like, I didn't feel like my deck was mine. You know, if you have a card that gives you, you know, lets you discard and draw, then, well, that's that's universal. Every, everybody wants that kind of card in their deck, and there's a lot of those. Or, you know, this card is worth four battle. All right, okay, so uh, everybody could use a four battle card. doesn't really necessarily combo with other things in my hand, which is... You know, people want that in the deck build. They want a deck that is theirs, purely and utterly theirs, and you are not getting that experience in this game. It, it's leaning towards this different experience of the push your luck. That point underscored to me uh, during one of the battles, I think it was called like the Chaos Dragon or something. Um, you know, surprise, surprise, the, the monster, one of the effects is everybody shuffle their decks together, deal out even cards to everybody, and go. <laughs> And we, <laughs> the group that I was playing with, still beat the snot out of the monster because all of our cards were awesome. Uh, it was a little bit of a difficulty. So one person didn't bother culling their zeros, and so there's a couple more zeros floating around the deck, but it wasn't that big a deal. Uh, and when you can do that, when you can just mash together a, everybody's cards, redistribute, and still be at whatever it is, 90 95% effectiveness, and still kill the monster that you need to. Yeah, that's basically saying that 
other real decisions when it comes to actually crafting our deck and that core experience of like this deck is mine i grew it we did an episode a little while ago about you know what is special what you know what's the deal with deck builders and i a lot of people said that a lot of people said okay i'm building something that's mine and an irreplaceable no one else has this type of deck and i can't really say that in this game you know and if you're playing four players then at least two or three of the players even might have very very similar decks just you know depending on what lands uh inside of people's decks there's more minor stuff you know uh the way decks the way that the different players will defeat the monsters you might get uh one person is just you know you might get a little bit of an imbalance as the game goes on where some uh, certain players just get all the cards and the other players don't get a lot of cards at all uh you can play that off as like you know i'm the support character and you're the beef uh, uh i don't really love that in terms of game experience but you know uh it's not that bad and if it gets really bad there are ways to kind of trade cards so i'm not i just wanted to mention that one uh yeah as a, as a little bit of a difficulty and i don't want to belabor the negatives too much I, at, at the end of the day i do think that this game is worth checking out it might rob peter to pay paul it might take a little bit too much uh of the strategy from the buy phase and place all that strategy in the drawing of the cards and the push your luck and all that uh, but at the end of the day i'm glad that it went for something i'm glad that it went for something different i don't want to play the same old thing with a wrinkle over and over again uh, i was pleasantly surprised that it mostly worked um so worth a play worth a look that is heroes of tenefear all right so uh as promised i'm going to get into the discussion topic for the episode which is the psychology of cheating in content creation so <laughs> a little bit of a weird one i was definitely not planning uh to talk about this topic at all or even think about it uh but like i said in the intro uh a little bit of a brouhaha kind of exploded over the last week on twitter uh so i'll kind of break it down really fast i don't want to get into uh, the actual thing too much. I think it's been done to death. You can, you know, look at certain uh, Twitter feeds, and they've covered they covered the actual core issue uh, from many many different perspectives. So I'm just not going to spend too much time here. I just want to kind of devote more time to what the issue brought up, which is more a little bit more directly related uh, to what I experience here as a content creator. So just to kind of go over the basic basics. So. Um, a blogger named Katie Aidley. I'm not really sure if I'm pronouncing uh, that person's blog correctly. Um, I'm also going to be careful with pronouns because Katie uh, is very careful with pronouns. So I'm going to try to be as respectful as I can. So Katie was a blogger with Punchboard Media and a lot of different relationships in the board game universe, uh, famous for war game uh, content and some other uh, gaming as well. Uh, lots of friends within the industry and an active Patreon. Uh, I think there was a particular review of K-List that was found to be just lifted word for word paragraph, uh, paragraphs, multiple paragraphs at a time. There's no real denying that the plagiarism occurred. And Punchboard Media uh, released a statement saying that the relationship was not going to be continuing. And just it's just been kind of spinning out of control a little bit. So there's a couple things I liked about Katie's content, Katie's present uh, presence on Twitter, and a couple things I didn't like so much. Katie wrote a year or two ago about being harassed uh at uh different conventions so you know males would come up to her and make lewd comments or you know just all these like different uncomfortable things were happening and you know uh wrote the blog kind of shone a light on a lot of those things which i found uh, personally i found very instructive because it could made me look at some of my behavior uh and it's like okay is some are some of the things that i'm doing even if i'm not conscious of it you know making women uncomfortable uh, so that made me think a little bit, and that was, you know, kind of my introduction to the uh, the whole situation. However, the more I got into it, the more I was like uh, noticing that he's definitely on kind of what we call the SJW end of things, uh, quote unquote, social justice warrior, which is no one ever calls himself social justice warrior. That's just like what a conservative calls a liberal. <laughs> it's another epithet like uh, snowflake or something like that. Uh, but if somebody was going to kind of take out that moniker, Katie was definitely one of those people. I found um, that made it a little bit difficult for me. Katie at one point had come after uh, a, a, someone in the ward gaming universe that I consider a friend. I'm not going to dredge that up again, but you know, suffice it to say that you know comments were made and I thought that the situation was unfair and I thought that there was too much attacking and too much negativity and that whole thing. So it's like, uh, you know, uh, so I kind of have a little bit of a difficult time 
uh, with that end of things. So that that whole situation ended up, you know, for me being a person, it's like, okay, there's good, there's bad there. Uh, you know, let me just like kind of be part of my own little group. And I didn't really check in on uh, Katie's corner of the board gaming sphere too much. So then why am I going all over this? I'm going over this because then this plagiarism things happens and Katie admits it and it's out in the world and everything. And one thing I saw that was pretty ugly was this sense of like, let's name and shame. You know, I think people got a little bit overboard with this idea of like shaming. And let me be really clear here. Plagiarism is bad. Plagiarism is about as bad as it gets for content creators or basically the journalists of board gaming as we went over with the whole pay to view discussion, you know, Liz kind of talking about board game content creation as being a journalistic endeavor. Yeah, by that. I mean, especially as far as, you know, providing a service for the community, letting people know what to play, what not to play, and, you know, what's good, <laughs> what to enjoy in this hobby. So we're performing that kind of role. So it becomes really important that we are have integrity and that we don't steal people's work and that we are open and honest and transparent about what we're doing. So when you plagiarize something, that's in secret. You know, uh, you are not citing the person's work and <laughs> that is really bad because, you know, board gaming, the community is kind of new. We're still, you know, uh, building certain structures, you know, like we talked about before, there's no independent journalism uh, entity. Maybe the Dice Towers or something else is growing into that kind of size thing, but there's no, it's the Wild West, <laughs> you know, and people like the community has to police itself. So I guess what we're seeing is this idea of the community policing itself uh and saying okay wow this is a thing that cannot occur we must make sure that this will never ever occur again let's make an example out of this case go a little bit more in than we would if it was somebody else and i think that's just wrong i think it's i very much question you know uh especially like there's a thread on reddit that you know stayed open to its credit and you know uh i'm a big believer in having difficult conversations and everything so i'm glad that there were some threads that were open but i can still criticize some of the uh posters that were saying uh not enough you know uh katie released an apology and it's not enough I mean, not enough, please, you know, I mean, and I know there are a couple of people in that thread and Twitter and everything that were personally affected by uh, what Katie did. You know, there was a, I don't know who the writer was, but the writer that, uh, one of the writers that Katie cribbed from ended up quitting and just very, very frustrated. And it's just a very ugly situation. So if you're personally connected to that, I can kind of understand the visceral connection, but I really have to challenge that and say, I don't think that's just policing. I think there's some personal edge to it. And, you know, the person's already gone, basically. And the person has to, uh, Katie, <laughs> you know, uh, let's you know, keep the person's name in the forefront. Uh, they have to consider uh, what they're, what's what the next steps are. And it, it's not going to be great. So we don't need that kind of extra. That extra, I just don't, th don't believe that has too much of a place, especially, you know, like the private DMs and, uh, you know, attacking Katie's friends. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> I, mean, I really hope that the floodgates on that are nice and closed by the time this episode posts. Okay, so I mean, I didn't even want to talk about that. It just kind of got me. You know, I just, I don't like when people are negative or they just like take, you know, hop on a, a chance to be negative. And especially if they hop on like a high horse and they're negative from their high horse. That just really, really gets me. I mean, I think you know, I'm just a big person in humility. I mean, everybody has a reason for doing stuff. We shouldn't throw stones out of glass houses. Like we all got something going on, whether it's in the board gaming sphere or in something else. So it just gets my hackles up whenever uh, people kind of step outside of that humility box and pretend that they adopt the role that they maybe uh, should think twice about adopting. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. I had to kind of get that off my chest a little bit. Uh, you know, welcome comments about that. Maybe I'm totally off base or, you know, maybe I'm too much of a lovey-dovey huggy person and, you know, uh, maybe this needed to happen and I don't know, just whatever. Just, you know, you can, you know, comment about that and send me a private message. I'm always open to kind of talking about this stuff. So the main question that I wanted to deal with, the thing that really I took out of uh, all of these discussions and, you know, this is my context as a uh, psychologically oriented person, I'm always looking at motivation, I'm always looking at the why question is why. Uh, last week, we asked the question why board gamers cheat. And we talked about, you know, a sense of fairness. And we talked about, you know, honor and shame and not wanting to look bad and eat, soothing our egos and all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is, you know, is true, continues to be true and uh, applies in some level here. However, I think 
when it comes to content creation in particular, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like that there are some kind of misguided, wrongheaded, or just like lack of understanding of the, how content creation works and how there's actually a lot of pit traps, a lot of kind of seductive ways that you know, people can try to cheat the system. And plagiarism is obviously a big flaming example. I mean, it's just kind of so outside the bounds um, of what's acceptable. And I heard, you know, some people on the Reddit thread saying, oh, there's so much plagiarism around, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And come on, dude, uh, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to hear that. Uh, you know, that's, that's what definitely one of those things where, uh, you know, throwing out, accusations is just going to muddy the waters and make things even uglier uh, than they have to be. So just be really, really careful unless you're willing to, you know, be specific about an example, then that is not something that I would want injected into the mind space of people in board games that oh, they're all, we're all plagiarists and everything. But having said that, you know, outside the bound of plagiarism, there are a bunch of ways in which, you know, within content creation, there's all this uh, kind of gray behavior, stuff that doesn't seem like it's, when you look at it, it's like, okay, there's more than meets the eye here. You know, I think of something like YouTube subscriptions. Uh, let's say you have a channel, you know, they have a couple of thousand subs, like, okay, great. Uh, but then each individual video has, you know, a couple of hundred views. It's like, okay, uh, you know, how did you get to so many subs overall if so few people are watching your, uh, videos and, you know, I have, I'm not going to name names because I don't have concrete proof and I'm not, I don't feel like outing somebody unless I just ha I can really kind of hammer it. Like the person who did with Katie, they kind of linked all the articles and everything. And that's how they were able to present it, which is, which is how you do it. You know, you don't want to throw out an accusation to a specific person unless you have like concrete proof. But in this general thing, I'm kind of pointing to a specific behavior of, you know, uh, it's kind of questionable subs uh, on a YouTube channel to kind of goose those numbers, right? Uh, or people using bots to, you know, kind of flood, a, you know, a video or a piece of content with, you know, a bunch of numbers. And then all of a sudden, you know, so you get that subscribe, unsubscribe thing uh, where that also is going to inflate your numbers and push your numbers or whatever. And is that, it's not illegal, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, but it's, it's kind of shady, you know, I mean, you would like to link if you're look, clicking on somebody's piece of content, then... Uh, if there's a certain number of views or a certain number of clicks and everything that they're actually real people listening to those or watching or ingesting the content and not just bots, you know, people aren't going to admit that, that, oh, I'm using a bot in order to goose my numbers. We just talked about reviews. We talked about paid reviews. You can see the temptation to, you know, exist in the board gaming space, get compensated or have some sort of relationship with the publisher and then not disclose it. But it all goes back to why, 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 why? It doesn't make sense to some people. Why bother? It is such a small reward. You know, uh, oh, it's board gaming. It's just gaming. Or, you know, what are we talking under? There's a couple of thousand people. You know, there's so many people out there, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, I'm just going to come right to it, man. It It is a big deal. It's a very, very big deal. And, you know, saying that the rewards for this kind of cheating behavior, the plagiarism, the futzing on subs and the misrepresenting yourself like they say that where the rewards are so minimal is to completely misunderstand the psychology of why content creators do what they do i think that there's this idea that content creators do it for the love you know and i'm using scare quotes over here just to illustrate the point <laughs> I'm in my room of recording at like one o'clock in the morning just because I'm into this topic and I'm doing scare quotes in front of nobody. Um, yes, it's true up to a point. I think people get started because of love. I think people, uh, it provides that kind of first impetus into this thing, but there has to be so much more present that carries you past that initial burst of love. Content creators do what we do for the engagement for the community, for the role, for the niche. It, it You can't be a consistent content creator without it. You could you probably get a couple of videos out for the love. You know, you could probably do a couple of blogs for the love and for the passion uh, and all that jazz and everything. But if you don't get that feedback, you post a blog and no one reads it. You post a podcast and no one listens to it. You post a YouTube video, you get five views or whatever it is. It's demoralizing. I mean, there's always exceptions. I mean, there, there might be people like auteurs who just don't, who literally don't care. 
but for the vast majority of people, we're doing this for the engagement. There's no other reason we get out of this. You know, there's some of these other kind of perks and everything just pale in comparison to genuine feedback. Like I put something out in the world and other people are responding to it. Other people, you know, they say they love it. They say they were inspired by it. They say that it kind of motivated the behavior to buy or not buy a game. Uh, it, it, that stuff Every time, like I personally, and I can only speak for myself, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not way beyond uh, Katie right now, just to make perfectly clear, like, you know, I'm, I don't know Katie's motivations. I, I just know for that question, how it applies to me. And like, if I was in that situation of to be tempted to engage in some kind of negative behavior, you know, what would be the motivation for it? The motivation is connection, is feedback. We, not a single content creator can do this without some kind of in positive engagement, you know, and that can be reflected in a lot of ways. And, you know, I run a podcast and the podcast, you know, the ways in which I, you know, gauge feedback, you know, I get the occasional, uh, you know, geek mail and I get, you know, like we talk about feedback and everything and I get, a, you know, a little bit of feedback and, you know, I... <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I need kind of a personality transplant because I just don't, you know, there's some content creators that I'm so jealous of because they just ha it just happens, you know, they're so charismatic and they're so approachable and I, I wonder, you know, what I can do. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know, it's just not my thing. I'm not a person that gets that kind of feedback that way. I mean, you know, I have to admit if there was a way that I could, uh, you know, just, you know, have a uh, kind of a easier way to gin up the audience, to gin up the uh, Facebook mentions and to gin up all this other stuff. If there was a way to do that, that I can like shortcut the process and not get caught, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be tempted. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, just for the interest of total transparency, you know, ENGN, a weekly episode of ENGN will get about 1,300 downloads. And we have a user, uh, a service called Libsyn. And it, it's pretty cool to use that service because it's it, it actually kind of tracks not only downloads, but like where it's from. So, you know, we'll get downloads, you know, obviously most of it from the States, but, you know, a lot from Australia, a lot from EU. We've gotten downloads from Uruguay and Iran. We had three downloads from Iran one week. It's like, what? <laughs> I mean, that was like, you know, and let's talk about the positive end of it. That was super cool. I can only imagine what it's like to be, you know, a much bigger content creator. Like 1300 is like a, you know, drop in a bucket. 1600 for like bigger episodes, usually top 10s. So when you see a top 10, you know I'm trying to goose the numbers. <laughs> That'll go up to around like 16 or 1700 um, total downloads and everything. I, I can go, I can break down all that, uh, what it means. But, you know, that, it's kind of a, I guess, a mid-size, you know, low to mid-size podcast. You know, it's definitely bigger than, you know, some people out there, but it's smaller than, you know, the bigger folks. And, you know, I'm, there's also threads that come up. And I think uh, the Broken People, Luke Hector, you know, who's a, a dear, dear uh, friend, board gaming, you know, a friend of mine. He had a comment once of like, you know, it drives him crazy to see these threads of like, which podcast do you listen to? Which blogs do you listen to? And, you know, um, the Broken Meeple is not mentioned and, the, and Every Night's Game Night is not mentioned. And it's like, what? <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> I'm working my butt off every single week. And if there was like a shortcut to that, then I would be tempted to take it. You know, I, obviously, you know, I haven't so far. I'd like to think, you know, I mean, not to like to think. I mean, I think it's important for you guys to know that I'm not, you know, I, I try to be, have as much integrity as possible. Uh, I have not taken any intentional shortcuts. Let's put it that way. Um, and, if, and if it finds, if somebody finds out that I've kind of unconsciously snuck at something in there, then please point it out to me and I'll fix it right away and all that good stuff. But no intentional cheating here. But I want to come back to that point of the engagement. You know, the engagement is so critical to putting out consistent content to being a constant presence you know year you know week by week month by month year by year you know we you know i'm continuing to be honest with you guys being a content creator really rocks <laughs> i have anthony to thank you know he's the guy that invited me on the show or i, I put my idea to him and he allowed me to be on the show and eventually he allowed me to be a co-host and eventually i uh you know kind of took over the show and he allowed me to do it because he had his own show to do and he pays for the hosting for every on his game night, so uh, he just makes it easy for me to do what I do. So I'm always going to be thankful to that man uh, for allowing me to be this thing called a content creator, which is just an awesome thing to be. It's nice to just go to a con and say, 
I'm Jason from the Every Night is Game Night podcast. Oh, you have a podcast? Like you, you, you have something you can immediately talk about, which is interesting to people, especially in this sphere. Uh, you can go, you can go to publishers, and publishers are interested. They can say, oh, hey, you know, it's even amazing when they've heard of the show. You know, like I requested a review copy uh, until daylight. I think it was uh, an upcoming game. And, you know, the person said, oh, ENGN, a perfect home to have the game reviewed. It's like, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> that doesn't always happen. It doesn't even happen a lot. <laughs> uh, barely ever. And it's just, it's, it's like a big pop when it happens. And I can, again, I can only imagine if you're a bigger creator, uh, you know, how, you know, you might get the really big creator say, oh, there's a lot of problems. You get a lot of, you know, jerks and everything. But it's, it. This is awesome. Content creation is awesome. And I can honestly say that you cannot be a content creator without engagement. You cannot be a creator without an audience. You cannot be a consistent creator without an audience. Maybe, maybe 1% of people can be like an auteur who truly doesn't care. I really do think that the audience believes that a lot of us, way more of us, are we're just we're just doing this for the love and we're just doing this because we want to and uh, come on it, that that is a fundamental misunderstanding of how human beings work i mean so many of us are fed are sustained by the engagement maybe that's not the reason that a lot of us do it maybe you know uh there's a combination it's like a mixed motivation there's like for the love and for the engagement but it doesn't happen without that engagement so if if, if there was a shortcutty way to increase the engagement, increase the numbers, uh, increase the Patreon backers and everything, you know, temptation is there. It just is. And so, and we're human beings and some of us are going to fall into that temptation. That's just, you know, the way it is. And, you know, I, I agree, you know, if someone does fall into that temptation, they deserve to be named. But do we have to shame? Really? You know, uh, Obviously, it depends on the offense and everything, but it's, I don't know, I just have a little bit more empathy because I'm kind of seeing it from the human motivation side. You know, it's it's awesome to be a creator and we need that engagement and, you know, maybe we want to be stronger, but not just consecration all over the place. Anybody that has a creative endeavor and there's either a rejection, just outright rejection or just silence, you know, I don't care who you are, you're putting something out in the world and no response happens, it really hurts. It's anxiety provoking, it provoke it creates doubt and you know, oh it's just games and you know get over it and just do it whatever. It's, don't take it so seriously. It's not how we work. It just isn't how human beings work. I mean if you put your energy into something, if you put your uh, more than just a cursory amount of energy into it and that's what consistent creation is all about whether it's board gaming or otherwise then our then we have some skin in the game there's a there's a self there and where the self is out there and where it's vulnerable we're going to protect it and sometimes it's going to be in the best way possible but sometimes it's going to be not in so good a way all right so what's the take home you know, I'm at minute 49 of this podcast and, you know, I gave you guys a couple of reviews. Hopefully you enjoyed them. And, you know, I'm going on and on about, you know, why content creators do what we do. And uh, it basically, you know, it kind of stretches to any creative person, I think. Uh, anybody that wants to put stuff out there, I think. Um, it, it is not just for the love. Yes, it is for the love. Yes, it is for the passion. We can't do this without love and passion. However, you know, think of it like two wells that we're pulling from whenever we're looking for the motivation to keep going. And, you know, it's great when we can pull from both wells, when we can pull from our love and passion and when we can pull from our engagement. It just it just makes things sustainable. You know, you you enjoy listening to somebody for the months and the years and all that kind of stuff. Then, well, uh, that's where it comes from. You know, and that's just how human beings work. We're never going to do things only for the love. Never, never. That's just it's pie in the sky. Um, so what you can do is engage uh look at look at yourself look at the content that you're ingesting and if you find that you're listening to somebody enjoying somebody and it might not just be eng and it could be anybody you know the broken people <laughs> there you go luke i'm giving you a couple shout outs there uh you know uh shut up and sit down balling brothers uh you know a uh, solo bg uh solosaurus there's, uh, there's so many uh, different creators that are out there, the people that have been guests on the show, uh, you know, designers, publishers, like anybody who creates, the number one thing we're looking for is engagement. And if you enjoy 
what that person is putting out, then shout them out. You know, uh, share the share their stuff on Twitter. Or, uh, hit them up on a private message. Hey, I enjoy your show. Is that going to discourage cheating behavior and shortcutting behavior? Uh, probably not. <laughs> as much as I would love for that to be true, I'll give somebody a couple of positive comments and they won't cheat or they won't uh, sneak around uh, on some weird way. It may even encourage them to cheat more because they just want more of that positive stuff. I don't know. What I do know is, you know, the people that do what they do is because of the engagement. And that is a big deal. It's a big deal psychologically. And you guys know what I'm going to say. This is how human beings really work. All right. So this is the point of the show. We're going to wrap up and I usually announce a lot of my own personal plugs for every night's game night. I'm actually going to skip that this week just in the spirit of what we've been talking about. I'm actually going to... Uh, just encourage people to engage in other people's content. You know, um, I'm inspired by different creators, both in and out of board games. Um, I'm sure that if you're listening to a podcast, you have something else queued up that's next. Uh, you have a whole list of backlog, you know, 10, 12 podcasts that you listen to. Um, hit one of them up. Go into the iTunes store and give them a rating and make a comment and, you know, just t- you know talk about how much you enjoy their show. Uh, you know, talk to somebody on Twitter, talk to somebody on Instagram, Reddit, you know, uh, all these different platforms, you know, shout them out, uh, drown out those voices that say, oh, content creators, you know, uh, you know, they're mostly BS anyway, they're mostly shills and uh, uh, that, that stuff kills me. And we need as much positivity as possible in order to counter, you know, those gut punches that we see every once in a while. And uh, should I be calling them gut punches? No, but because at the end of the day, like that kind of comment doesn't really bother me, but you know, it's just kind of like volume, you know, it's like, you know, chip, 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 and that kind of, you know, it's a real bummer. Um, so let's fight against that, you know, make some positive engagement with people, tell people you enjoy their stuff, and come back next week. Uh, we are going to have another interesting topic next week. Uh, I happen to know what the episode's going to be about next week. We've already recorded it, and it's actually going to be a special one, you know, it talks a little bit about uh, you know, engagement and how, you know, uh, things in board gaming can kind of stir some things up in us psychologically. So, um, hope you enjoy that. Hope you enjoy the show. Um, as Anthony would say, go ahead and grab a game off of that shelf and let's make every night a game night.